Hello, I'm Dr. Ira Nash. Welcome to Well Said. Today, we'll be discussing what feels to me to be a real revolution in medicine, the availability of a new class of drugs that can help people lose weight. With obesity on the rise in recent years and the difficulty many people have in losing weight, these drugs have been a game changer for many people. Yet because they're relatively new, there's a lot we don't know about them. To help sort through what we do know, I'm delighted to welcome back to Well Said, Dr. Jamie Kane. Dr. Kane is the Chief of Obesity Medicine and the Director of the Center for Weight Loss Management at Northwell Health. He also serves as an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. Jamie, welcome back to Well Said. Thanks for having me back, Ira. So, Jamie, when we had you on the show a few years back, we were talking about obesity and COVID-19 and how they represented kind of overlapping pandemics. Well, I guess the COVID-19 pandemic is mostly over, not completely, but we don't think about it as a pandemic anymore. What's the current status of the obesity pandemic? Yeah, unfortunately, it hasn't gotten softer like the COVID pandemic did. We still have, you know, whopping rates of obesity, particularly in minority populations. You know, numbers that we would care about, you know, either stay like astronomically high or or continue to go up. And when um, you say numbers we care about, what kind of numbers are you talking about? Numbers meaning rates of obesity, rates of serious obesity with the extra high BMIs, obesity in minority populations, you know, particularly like minority women and children. Just to be clear, when you say BMI, you're talking about body mass index? Sorry, yeah. There are many ways to look at obesity. A body mass index is probably not the best, but it's the most commonly used and the easiest to use. It's a simple ratio that involves height and weight. Okay. There is still a lot of obesity around. And is it getting worse? Yes. Okay. I think our listeners are probably familiar with the fact that there's been a movement in recent years to destigmatize obesity, which in general I think is, is a good thing. But I wonder if it has also blunted the message that there is a relationship between health outcomes and being overweight and obese. And I wonder if you could just make that connection for us again? It's complicated. In all walks of life, probably the worst being in the medical community, there's a tremendous amount of anti-obesity bias. There's been studies in employment interviews that people with obesity are less apt to find solutions and they tend to be lazier. I mean, there's no evidence that that's actually true, maybe even the opposite under certain circumstances. In the medical community, it tends to be even worse. So assumptions that patients uh, aren't trying hard, that all their diseases are self-inflicted. There are explicit biases, but also implicit biases, you know, as I, yeah. like the types I'm, I'm talking about, that then govern physician attitudes towards their patients. Um, and interestingly, this gets a little bit, a little bit into the weeds, but there's some like paradoxical findings with that in terms of like how you would actually manage a patient. So physicians who believe that obesity is this self-inflicted choice tend to believe that the lifestyle modification is really the only way they should they should manage these patients, and they're the least likely to talk about it with their patients. Oh, wow. Um, so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of these people are sick, and they did it to themselves, and there's nothing we can do about it, and so forth. If you look at, at the anti-obesity stigma, the instinct is to say, well, let's get away from the blame game, which I think is true. Number two, I think we have to think of obesity as a chronic disease and not just a lifestyle choice, and that, that is kind of connected. That said, that doesn't mean that it's safe to have obesity. We know there's a, a J-shaped mortality curve. What we mean is at the lowest weights, like super, super low weight, and then as weights go up, starting with, with just being a little bit overweight, you're more likely to die than if you have normal weight. And so we can't look at that and look at the 13 types of cancer we know for sure are associated with obesity and the increased risk of heart attacks and strokes and diabetes and sleep apnea and arthritis and disability and say... It's all the same just because other people are biased against obesity. So I think we have to be smart and just separate the two, you know, treat people like they're people, um, and at the same time try to manage the disease process and the things related to it in a fair manner. I think that's a really challenging message sometimes to get across. And so I'm going to try to summarize what you just said, and you tell me if I got it straight. So people who are obese face all kinds of discrimination, and we need to limit the exposure to that kind of discrimination. But at the same time, there are significant health consequences to being overweight and obese. Correct. Okay. So let's talk about the new drugs for obesity. But before we do that, how important are changes to diet and physical activity in reaching and maintaining a healthy weight? You said before that physicians who are 
biased against people who are overweight tend to overestimate the value of diet and exercise. How valuable is it? It's a tricky sentiment because it's still the most important factor. It's certainly the most Im important causative agent in obesity, right? If, if people ate fewer calories, if they ate better quality food, if they moved more like we did in, in olden times, we would weigh less and we would have less obesity, right? So it still is, is the number one factor. I think in the particular case of bias, it's assigning blame for how this happens. I right? see. So we live okay. in what we call an obesogenic environment, meaning the foods that we're exposed to, the economic incentives in our entire kind of global system are one to overproduce food and produce food that is hyper palatable. We want to eat too much of it. it. It almost has a drug effect. And then we have a lot of mechanisms within our body to prevent us from losing weight or at least to prevent us from keeping that weight off. And it's more like the state of nature where fatness is less of a problem than thinness. Um, and so when you put that all together, it makes it very hard to manage the situation. That said, it still comes down mainly to the the food. I, I'm not trying to get controversial here, but the current drug company and I guess the people who are doing their bidding in the medical world sentiment is, you know, this is a chronic disease, which I agree with, and that if you start medications, you're on them for life because it's a chronic disease. There's a lot of potential bias, you know, when millions of dollars are exchanging hands. It's not to say explicitly that someone is saying they paid me $2 million to say this, but more like the worldview kind of comes together to give us this notion of, you know, you're kind of stuck on, on this pattern forever. All right. So let's talk um, about the drugs because yeah. that's where these millions of dollars are changing hands. And it right. does seem to be kind of a revolution in how people with obesity get managed or can hope to lose weight. Tell us just a little bit about the basics. What are these drugs? What do we know about how they work? The newer drugs are based on incretin hormones. So these are hormones that are produced in the gut and to some extent the brain after we eat. Right? So they give us the signal that we've eaten and a lot of stuff starts happening based on that. You know, changes in the liver producing extra blood sugars, you know, under the ideal healthy eating circumstances would be suppressed, but in obesity and with, uh, you know, kind of Western diet won't be as much. You know, this helps with that. Um, it helps release insulin kind of in a timely, efficient manner. It sends a signal to your brain that says you've eaten already. So, so satiety, we talk a lot about appetite, but satiety is the back end, meaning uh, I'm done eating. So people get a sense of fullness earlier. And then we've seen a lot of patients saying that their cravings have, have dissipated, not everyone, even for things not related to what they were trying to do. So I have patients who were wine drinkers, and they really hadn't intended to cut back on their wine, but they just stopped. Yeah, we'll come back to that yeah. in a minute. But I want to dive a little more deeply into the mechanism of action in yeah. terms of obesity. Is the dominant effect here that it just makes people less hungry and therefore they eat less? Or is there something else metabolically going on. So I would say drugs. two things are the major, the two major sources of help here are going to come from, you know, decreased caloric intake total. And then number two is going to be improved what we call insulin sensitivity. So there's a term called insulin resistance and the opposite is insulin sensitivity. Like how efficiently are you taking blood sugar up using insulin? Taking it up into the... Taking it up into cells as right. opposed to in your bloodstream. Okay. Right. You know, probably most commonly the muscle and liver, for instance, mm -hmm. right? young people, athletic people, fit people, they're, they're going to be particularly efficient at doing that. But if you get resistant to insulin, um, what happens is your body doesn't take up the glucose efficiently. There's some sort of something going on blocking the insulin from working. And so your body's response is to produce more and more and more insulin. And that high insulin, it doesn't just take up the glucose into your cells, it also stores fat. And I mean, it has other effects as well. But um, the overwhelming majority of patients with serious obesity have this insulin resistance. So helping with that also, I believe, helps the process and not just saying, we're going to knock your appetite out. Because some older drugs like fentermine can be pretty good at knocking out appetite. appetite. And yet the net weight loss on average is like 10 to 11% over two years, whereas the newest drugs are over 25%. So there's something more to it than just right. suppressing appetite, making people feel like they've eaten when they have it. Right. And there are some effects on metabolism, like how many calories your body's burning and water levels. But those, are, I think, are quite minimal compared to the two that I mentioned. So who seems to benefit the most from these medications? That's, it's a loaded, a loaded question because you know, I, I think it's a minority of people that are taking them inappropriately. 
but if your body is relatively sensitive to the action of all these hormones, then you know almost anyone can lose weight taking them. But I think the more insulin resistance you have, and the more disease burden you have, you know, besides just the weight, and the more other factors that get in the way. For instance, if you're on medications that cause increased appetite or increased insulin resistance, some psychiatric medications are like that, then it is more helpful probably than just diet alone. Yeah, I would say that those are the populations that we move towards first. And for people for whom it is appropriately prescribed and they are substantially overweight, how effective is it? I mean, in terms of percent body weight or numbers of pounds that people lose, and we're talking about a lot of weight, a little weight? So if you look at you know the original studies prior to these drugs getting approved, the newest medication, um, I'll give you the generic name, terzepatide, has multiple forms. We're talking about roughly 26% weight loss over 88 weeks. That is an enormous number. I mean, that's like bariatric surgery level weight loss without the surgery. Unlike some of the older meds, which had you know basically a six-month grace period, and then you start trickling up. I mean, this seemed to keep trickling as time went on. The semaglutide is closer to 16%. That was the breakthrough of about three years ago now. Yeah. Um, and then any of the older stuff, we're talking about closer to 10 or 11%. Our team is particularly interested in the lifestyle components. We stick to unrefined foods, very high in fiber, you know, mainly based on plants. Those patients have tremendous weight loss if you combine it with the medication. Like, what are we talking about? I mean, it's not to say that they'll exceed the 26% or so, but just in the first few months, some patients just have tremendous responses. Yeah. I hate to give numbers 20 plus pounds a month. That's not our intention. Mm -hmm. It's just a byproduct of, of how efficient their system is working compared to their size. But just to be fair, I mean, it, it's not uncommon for somebody to lose, as you said, 20 pounds in a month. Correct. And yeah. we have some patients who have much more subtle weight loss um, that tends to be based on you know mitigating factors like inability to move, mm -hmm. you know, or they, they really haven't bought into any dietary changes and they're eating pretty poor quality, you know, high fat, high animal protein diets with some refined foods and they're just decrease their appetites. And we see much qu more quickly they tend to kind of wear out the medication's effect. What are some of the common side effects of these drugs? So when I talk to patients, I talk about the common stuff and then the scary stuff. Okay, let's All right, and I wanna, do it And I want to get to both because the scary sure. stuff I think is not talked about enough. And the scary stuff hasn't really changed our overall, as new studies come out, we haven't changed how we, we act necessarily, but it changes our conversation with patients. It makes it longer. Okay. So from a common standpoint, you think physiologically what's happening, right? So the GLP-1, you might hear GLP-1 receptor agonist. That means that this is mimicking that GLP-1 hormone in the body. And what it does is it, one of the mechanisms by which it decreases appetite is it slows down how fast food moves through your stomach. Okay. What that means is that potential side effects related to that would be things like heartburn, you know, reflux, the more modern the name. food's just sitting, food's just in sitting there longer. Yeah. Nausea can be from that, but also directly from the, the GLP-1 receptor itself can induce that. And um, that seems to be more in some medications than others and more in some people than others. I see occasional diarrhea, but much more commonly constipation. And we think that's also from this, the transit time of food from mouth to the end is going to be slower. Not for everyone, but a fair number. And that as time has gone on, and even if we, we've moved to the modern agent with less of the nausea, we're still seeing a lot of the constipation that hasn't, hasn't gotten away. Before we get to the scary side effects, yeah. which I do want to give you time to explain, just to review, these are all medications given by injection, right? So if you're talking about the FDA approvals, yes. These same medications are covered for both FDA approved for diabetes and for obesity, both. You know, until the rules have gotten super strict, you know, over the last six months and particularly in January. In our field, we've used them interchangeably because we just, you know, we don't want to limit our patients, so we get them what we can. There is a oral version of semaglutide. You know, people think of it as, as Ozempic and Wagovi. There's a pill version of that that we use as well sometimes. Now it's generally limited to people with, with diabetes. Is it just as effective taken orally? Almost as effective, but it doesn't go to the higher doses. I see. So okay. it's like old-fashioned Ozempic. The side effects you talked about just now seem to me more like nuisance side effects or things that people might find unpleasant but not life-threatening in any way. You know, if, if someone has the, the, the condition gastroparesis, mm -hmm. you know, some of our patients have had diabetes for a long time. That's a slowing of food through the stomach. Exactly. And that means the nerves are not firing appropriately to move 
things along if you add a chemical to stop that on top of a natural predisposition. But these should come up in conversation when you're, when you're prescribing them originally. And I think our patients tend to run into a lot fewer problems than someone maybe out with a community primary care doctor who, who's seeing 35 patients a day and, and might not have the nuanced experience about this. I think I think that tends to happen a little more often, and, yeah. and we, we sometimes take patients off this for that reason. So what are the scary things? A couple that I think are worth mentioning. So thyroid cancer. Really? Right? So thyroid cancer sounds scarier than it probably is in most cases. Um, the most common type of thyroid cancer is called papillary thyroid carcinoma with a cure rate of over 99%, even if it's widely spread. It sounds a lot scarier than it is. I mean, granted, no one wants their thyroid out. No one wants to go through sure. cancer and then have to spend the rest of their life on thyroid medications. But the first two large reviews did not show statistically significant, meaning not by chance, evidence of thyroid cancer increases in these this class of medications. Now, granted, this was probably largely done on older medications because it would have, had to have looked at multiple years. And the higher dose semaglutide that we see in the newer drugs have only been out for a couple of years. How common is that, though? Is it, is I mean, it's still going to be relatively uncommon. It, it's rare. Okay. Right, right. There's like a black box warning. I don't know if it's technically a black box warning or just a warning that if, if someone has what's called multiple endocrine neoplasia, which is multiple hormonal-based tumors, and, and usually that comes out, you know, other people in their family have had it and they've had a couple. We don't give it because a scarier type of thyroid cancer called medullary thyroid cancer, that does actually have a, you know, a real mortality rate. We, we definitely want to avoid. But you're rarely going to find anyone with that condition. You know, papillary thyroid carcinoma, the third study done looking at insurance data in France, and you know, France is good at insuring their patients compared to America, they were able to, to track people on this class of medications, and it was statistically significant. And it wasn't just the medullary thyroid carcinoma. It was all thyroid carcinoma. But I've spoken to people who are kind of familiar with the statistical methods used, and there's some question. But if you look at the two previous studies, which showed like a linear trend that didn't reach statistical significance, add to this one. So you think there's I, something real? I there. think there's something small but real, and it's worth bringing up. Anything um, else that uh, is in the rare but scary category? Yeah, so a couple of them. One is going to be pancreatitis. So that would be inflammation of the pancreas, not a fun experience. No, um, it's a very painful. Yeah, I just had a patient with that a few weeks ago. I think the most common causes outside of these medications would be gallbladder disease. So something's blocking the pancreas from releasing its enzymes or large amounts of alcohol consumption. So if someone is drinking multiple drinks a day, you know, we make a deal, you know, either not or we don't. Rec okay. I don't recommend the medications. I know other people in the field that are more liberal about it, but I, I just don't want to see yeah, yeah. You know, this particularly scary and very unpleasant condition happen. One thing we do know is that it decreases how hard a gallbladder squeezes. So people think of a gallbladder mm -hmm. as just like major organ. It's just a sac right. that holds bile. And when you eat, and particularly when you eat high fat, you know, the, it squeezes and the bile comes and it's going to bind to fat. The GLP-1, in, especially in high amounts, will decrease how hard the gallbladder squeezes. So is that a setup for people developing gallstones? Well, I don't know whether it starts them anew, but if you have gallstones, it's more likely to get stuck. And that's where, you know, having a gallstone sitting in the gallbladder is irrelevant unless it's getting stuck in a tube, right? right. And then it's tantamount to giving birth. Yeah. Uh, um, my mother had that many in years. Terms of the pain. In terms of the pain, yeah. Of the pain. yeah. yeah. So that is something. And if you look at the data from the national health system in England, it did look like the rates of people on these medications for having to need a gallbladder out was double. The most recent study looking at pancreatitis showed an increased rate, whereas previously there wasn't. I think it was up to four or five times the rate for people not taking these medications. But keep in mind, it's a very low, right. low number. So an, an, an increased risk, but in absolute terms, still a pretty low still risk. Still relatively low. It did not show the gallbladder dysfunction, which is interesting because that was so blatant in yeah. England. Do we know anything about the longer-term effects of these drugs? I, I know it's kind of a funny question because they're relatively new, but right. so what, so what do we know about the longer? Yeah. I think the long-term stuff right now, and I, I might eat my words 20 years from now, but the long-term, it looks probably more favorable than not. We know that people with renal failure and people with heart failure and, and a bunch of other diseases actually probably do, do better on this stuff than not. And so, and so the presumption is you're not causing any, any necessarily any major damage. And we do know that while there are potential risks associated with this, as I started out talking earlier about why we care, right, is, you know, if, if you're 200 pounds overweight, your life expectancy is not normal. Like your health span yeah. in particular would be curtailed. So it looks like this is going to be beneficial and keeping in mind that these are relatively rudimentary drugs that will be improved over the next couple of decades. 
So that leads to my next question, which is, it's my understanding that most people's experience with this is that if they're on the drugs and lose weight and then stop the drugs, they gain the weight back. Is that yeah. your experience? And is that kind um, of common? I think it depends on the context. So first part of context is, I would say, roughly 95% of people that lose weight by any means I think maybe not as much bariatric surgery, although I think a lot more people gain weight than the statistics are yeah. willing to admit. But it's about 95% of people that lose weight by other means gain weight back within three years. There are so many mechanisms to increase appetite, to increase the desire for high calorie foods, and to slow down metabolism to get our weight back in addition to the environment we live in where we're stuck surrounded by this stuff. That's part of the context. Unfortunately, because of the modern kind of medical economic and and logistics in terms of you know, sourcing the medications and new rules and guidelines coming out. We have a lot of patients who are being withdrawn immediately off medications. So those on high dose medications, I tend to see a pretty rapid weight regain. Uh, their appetite comes storming back. Those who have lost a bunch of weight, who are exercising, who are eating many more plants, very high fiber, you know, trying to avoid added fats and sugars and so forth. Those patients I found that we're able to start tapering off slowly, and our goal is to either get them off or get them on what we call the lowest effective dose. Now, the lowest effective dose might be zero or might be half the dose. You know, when we're, we're figuring that out, I think time will tell long term. But I think looking at these meds as a solitary panacea is going to be a mistake long term. Well, you know, it raises another related question in my mind, which is, given what you just said, should we be thinking about treating obesity the way we treat high blood pressure, which is, yes, there are lifestyle things that you can do that are of benefit, but by and large, people who are on medication for their high blood pressure, unless they do sort of extraordinary things, lose a lot of weight, become much more physically active, change their diet substantially, most people end up on antihypertensive drugs indefinitely. Are we headed that way where we're thinking about obesity as a chronic illness where these folks are on these drugs for the rest of their lives? I think a population of people, yes. What I will say about it is this, and I always want to say the caveat is that my career and our research and all, all dedicated to the lifestyle components of this. But, you know, the, these meds are here and I still think we're better off having them than not. Um, and we use a lot of them, particularly compared to, say, five years ago. Mm-hmm. It is easier to control blood pressure with lifestyle than it is to control weight. If we look at this as a chronic disease, and this is you know message to insurers and to drug companies that charge a fortune for this stuff, is that if this stuff is probably going to be around in a large majority of our patients that are taking them, whether it's these medications or, or newer generations to come, if I tell you to eat beans and greens and whole grains and you know fruits and vegetables and mainly that, your blood pressure is going to go down. Yes. You know, particularly you're going to be limiting sodium. Mm -hmm. You're going to be, you know, dilating blood vessels. Your blood pressure can go down. You add exercise and weight loss to that. You manage sleep apnea. You do all this stuff. Your body's not going to rebound and suddenly create extra salt and make your blood pressure higher. But if you do all that and you lose weight, your appetite hormones are still going to go up. Yeah. Your metabolism is still going to slow down. And the more you exercise, the more hung the hungrier you're going to get. And you're still around this environment. So I, I think we have to think about this long term. Now, the strategies can evolve stuff besides just medications. But yes. The notion of short-term weight loss to fix stuff other than like than photo shoots is we have to get past that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. You know, I want to get back to something you mentioned earlier about how these drugs also seem to affect people's behavior in other ways, cravings for alcohol. I've read about like obsessive behaviors of other sorts. What do we know about the non-weight loss potential applications of these drugs? I've seen that. I think a lot of times with medications, I'd say over the last 30 years, we have designer medications. But before that, a lot of medications were kind of stumbled upon, originally intended for something else, and then a better use was found long term. I've seen enough of this, of people changing their cravings. Keep in mind that we start our conversations like, look, I really don't want you drinking two glasses of wine every night on right. these. But they admit later on, I wasn't really intending to stop. I just didn't stopped. feel like it. Yeah. I just like lost the flavor for it, the desire for it, and so forth. And I've heard that about junk food. And I, again, I haven't seen data on binge eating, but we have a lot of patients come to us with binge eating disorders, over consuming, not just eating out and then eating more calories than they want, but over consuming way past fullness, an entire loaf of bread, you know, an entire box of cookies, you know, two pints of ice cream, that type of binge, who stopped? Now, I discussed mindful-based approaches with them. We've put them on, you know, these types of diets I'm talking about that control appetite. 
But I can't help but think I've been discussing those things for many years and the rates of people stopping binging. You didn't get more convincing just recently. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, maybe 5% more convincing with practice. I think that there's an effect. And it's, it's it's not across everyone. Yeah, I've, I've noticed an effect, particularly with the newer stuff. So where is the field going? There are a couple of parts of this. So one is like where are the medications going, right? Mm-hmm. These are fantastic breakthroughs, and I think they're more likely will come out. What I can say is on the anti-obesity medication front is like cross our fingers because outside of like fentermine, everything else in the history of this field has been taken off the market for you know, long-term problems. As opposed to other ones which just were intended to decrease appetite, we see a multitude of effects here. And these medications are coming from other places. So I, I, I'm hoping that, you know, as you get more specific, we have, we have fewer issues. There are newer medications that will be coming out. So as I mentioned, the pill form of semaglutide, they are working on that higher dose, which would be the equivalent of the, the Wagovi, that high dose. And so the hope is that, that you know, that comes out. And so for people that don't want the injection, and frankly, just more supply would be helpful. Right. So what I'm hearing is easier to take maybe side effect or safety profile. These no, are things, no, no it's, it's the same drug. No, no, no. But I mean, in terms of future. Oh, future. Yeah, yeah. So, so the hope is eventually side effect and efficacy. And, and there, are, there are other, I mentioned GLP-1. And then there's, there's another one called GIP. I mean, no one has to really memorize these. But there's, there's even another one called glucagon, another hormone that's being – so there's a potential for, for a three, three – Three different kinds of medications. All the, well, no, one medication with oh, all three oh, is wow. one possibility okay. or any combination of two of these because mm-hmm. um, we saw the, the, the newest one with two is working better than, the, than the just the GLP one, both yeah. in terms of being more tolerable to take and, and much more weight loss. Down the road, there are things that work on like antibodies against things that break down muscles – like these, um, and and interestingly, it was originally targeted for diabetes, but more weight loss than even the current medications with increase in muscle mass. You know, some of the stuff that we're all worried about. You know, there's potential. Obviously, that one's kind of breaking new ground, so we'd have to see what the long term effects are. I think that's the case. I wonder what's going to happen with surgery. I know you know there are a lot of movements to increase the the availability of surgery. I think as time goes on and the meds become more available, the, the number of surgery, surgeon, surgeries are going to go down. There are definitely cases that I have of people where we had them on high-dose medication that didn't matter until they got surgery. But it seems that like neither one in and of itself was enough. It was the combination. So yeah. there might be a place for severe obesity long-term with surgeries. Then on our end, you know, we're working on figuring out ways to teach people about you know, the healthy, sustainable, long-term eating that doesn't just affect weight, but affects all the other parameters that we care about, you know, in terms of cancer prevention and coronary disease prevention and reversal of diabetes. And, you know, there's good research on that. And, and we're, we're hoping to, to make that a part of the mainstay and then hopefully be able to create some sort of long-term cultural change that allows us not just to catch people who weigh 300 pounds and, and try to get them to eat more broccoli, but make it that high fiber foods are more of a normal part of eating and the education of kids. And right now we're just talking about what we're doing after 70% of America has some sort of metabolic disease. Right. Going upstream, preventing this, creating yeah. more healthy lifestyles. I, I think without that, and all of this is spinning our wheels. Yeah. yeah. At the risk of an awful pun, I think we've created an appetite for people to learn more about these drugs and obesity treatment. Where would you recommend people go for high quality information if they have questions about what we've been talking about? So if you go to lay sources for for medical stuff, it can get pretty dicey. Well, that's why um, I ask. <laughs> yeah. What I would generally say is certainly speak to your doctor. When you're talking about the medications, speaking to your doctor. And generally speaking, if you're going to an obesity specialist, generally stay in the academic environment where hopefully there are a little less pressure and kind of mill-like, just everyone gets the same treatment. There are a few resources I think that I really like in terms of the lifestyle components. One is nutritionfacts.org, which is looks at evidence-based nutrition. He goes through thousands and thousands of studies, you know, granted with a plant-based bent, but mm-hmm. turns out the evidence points in that direction anyway. The guy's named Michael Greger, and he's written a few books. The, the best book that I've read on this is How Not to Diet by Michael Greger. I also really like the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, and they have a lot of programs that are helpful as well. Well, Jamie, thank you so much. 
Great to be here again. Uh, my guest has been Dr. Jamie Kane. He is the Chief of Obesity Medicine and the Director of the Center for Weight Loss Management at Northwell Health. He's also an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. Thanks also to our editor, Jared Bassman, to our producer, Connor Pilkington, and our audio engineer, Ambrose Rajendran. For more information about this program and to find all of our past episodes, please visit our website at medicine.hofstra.edu slash well said. You can also subscribe to our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Our listeners are welcome to send comments, suggestions, and questions to well said at hofstra.edu. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ira Nash, and that's Well Said.